Our next speaker is Elizabeth Kavicki, did I pronounce that correctly? Who I understand also shares an interest in reproducing historical experiments. Did I get that right? Yeah. Two for two. <laughs> it's my joy to be part of this gathering celebrating the work and teaching of Jed Buckwald. Jed opened for me and in turn for my students the curiosities, instruments, and thinking of those who came before us. Through ever emerging relations among us, science phenomena, and past investigators, our classroom activities launch adventures that deepen into reflection and experience shared with history. I'll open with remembrances of the year I studied with Jed. Next, I'll exert from adventures from my teaching and learning with students and companions from history. I also want to thank all of you for your researching and expressing from the science and philosophy of human history. 25 years ago, I was a second year doctoral student at Harvard Graduate School of Education, seeking to change how physics is taught. MIT physicist Phil Morrison, who inspired this aspiration and was um, my undergraduate uh, physics advisor at MIT, encouraged me to cross-register back to MIT for STS-150, Aspects of 19th Century Physics with Professor Buckwald. STS-150 was the first and only history of science course that I ever took. At its beginning, I could not foresee the fascination of electrical effects and their historical analyses. With classmates Diana Greco and Babak Ashrafi, we met in the beautiful spaces of the Dibner Institute. Viewing the bolt of pile and friction machine in the Dibner Gallery augmented our readings. The spontaneity and expanse of Professor Buckwald's knowledge of 19th century electrical investigations was staggering to me then and remains so. During class, he reconstructed his understanding, asked questions, and conjectured. He exemplified the investigative spirit and practice of the history and science we studied together. Professor Buckwald placed us in the room with Orsted on the verge of moving from idea to experiment. Buckwald expressed that drama saying, we must turn our attention to the world where this truth will find its only corroboration. Otherwise, unity itself becomes a barren and empty thought leading to no insight. Orsted took risks when performing his famous experiment for the first time during a lecture, placing a magnetic compass needle around a conducting wire. Wouldn't you try it out first, our professor demanded of Orsted. He brought us to the day in 1820 when, as he said, nature spoke loudly enough in a classroom that its effect was instantly reproducible worldwide. For me, Professor Buckwald's responses to past efforts in understanding nature resonated with Piaget's analyses that I was intrigued to apply in education. Learners develop new capacities exploratively and experience periods of both increased understanding and increased uncertainty as their capacities develop. Noticing this pattern of cognitive development in Buckwald's portrayals of history, I became curious to investigate it for myself. I considered the potential of each new topic in our class for this project. But then, my classmates and I fell behind. Starting a new topic, on November 1st, Professor Buckwald's opening questions, which he presumably saw as easy, unthreatening, and obvious, what is the Royal Institution, who was Michael Faraday, what was his training, were met with dead silence. Not stopped by our shortcoming, Professor de Buckwald dove into the experiments whose startling effects and inferences he said we know down to the hour. With Faraday's diary putting us at Faraday's side, moment by moment, I contemplated evidence for active learning in history and ourselves. Professor Buckwald's enthusiasm for how Faraday discovered paramagnetic and diamagnetic behaviors and used these in seeking out field properties thrilled me in a way that never came to light or life in all the physics courses I'd taken through graduate level field theory. I read volumes of Faraday's diaries and experimental researches with wonder for the materials, open thinking, and confusions of Faraday, but I found myself utterly lacking in experiences such as underlay Faraday's work. Encouraged by Professors Buckwald and Morrison to interpret Faraday 
through during lab activities, I commenced a project extending across two summer months of daily work in an empty lab at Harvard. Physicist Wolfgang Ruckner and my electrical engineering brother Tom engaged in frequent discussion with me about surprises and materials that arose along the way. I wanted to see the phenomena that Faraday spoke of so vividly, bismuth turning crosswise to magnet poles, the strange dance of copper, and ordinary materials that are curiously obedient to magnets. I hope to understand, not just from Faraday's words, but also from the phenomena directly, complexities that I imagined would make beginnings for learning and experimenting. Faraday's diary inspired me to write, calculate, diagram extensively in my notebook, integrating with my own questions and my struggles to understand Faraday and what he saw. Unlike Faraday, I was a novice experimenter, learning to observe, innovate, and question through perplexity at what happened. Where chemical batteries activated the great royal institution's electromagnet in a moment, I used a lab power supply whose output had to be gradually increased, bringing up to eight amps of current to the electromagnet. To start, I hung my samples on two-foot strings into the magnet's narrow gap and brought up the current. Nothing happened. Over succeeding sessions, my rig moved to a room without air vents, where I built this tarp tent and shields from air currents. On a string suspended now from the ceiling, passing through a long cardboard tube, I attached samples of common materials, penny, candy, glass, Pepto-Bismol, nails, liquids, liquids and liquids, and minerals. A chemist assisted me in melting bismuth, pouring it into a mold for an oblong ingot that I then hung so that it would have that uh, oblong shape. I began to observe motions then and orienting and positions of my improvised samples around the electromagnet's poles. Incongruities in these responses had me curious about possible variations in the field of my electromagnet. So then I formed glass sleeves, shown here in the bottom, that were filled with magnetized sand and placed these at different places in the gap for visualizing and sketching the magnetic field in analogy with Faraday's iron filings shown above here. By accompanying Faraday into the motions and vagaries of materials around magnetism, I met firsthand the phenomena, questioning, and wonder of Faraday's 1845 diary entries, such as show the new magnetic property, truth of nature, in contrast with that assumed. Bismuth, is it because it's crystalline or what? And contrary currents, if so, look for and find them. Experimenting became for me evocative of our minds and actions in risk taking, being in an uncertainty, observing, imagining. I became intrigued to create openings where learning and teaching is experimenting, welcoming all these qualities of unexpected realizations and thoughtful questioning, of spontaneity and reflection, of doubt and analogy. Historical science experiments and materials which I first engaged with deeply in Professor Buckwald's course and in this research project for it, continue to inspire me and my students in going into the unknown as explorers, where learning and teaching is collaborative, emergent, experimental. These incipient relations between experimenting and learning and teaching extended in my next study, my dissertation, where three teachers, Laura Allen, David Williams, Jamie Bell, explored electricity for one year with me as their teacher. One class, I provided them with a special wire, nichrome. Laura described puzzlement. You couldn't solder it. We needed the Enterprise Lab to test it. As Faraday sometimes did, they put it aside, but not out of mind. Later, David brought alligator clip leads from home. This fastened the nichrome wire to other elements. Laura and David set up two circuits. In one, the connecting wire was copper, in the other, nichrome. The bulb in the copper wire circuit glowed brighter. This pairing of a nichrome wire circuit with a copper wire circuit was the group's first explicit circuit-to-circuit -circuit comparison. 
Then David expressed a new experimental thought. He said, I was thinking if we wanted to make an experiment, we could make it with this chrome wire and keep on adding chrome wire so we could just barely see the light. The route from this conjecture to its test was convoluted. Next, they constructed circuits of battery bulb and short nichrome wire, maintaining that the short nichrome wire would glow like a bulb filament. In our final moments of that day's lesson, Laura wanted to try a long nichrome wire, but the long nichrome wire I had was bare and tangled, posing a further unknown. Laura wondered, where is the electricity? If it's along the hole, well, let's untangle it. Stretching out the wire to its whole length, they connected a battery and a bulb. That the bulb showed nothing delighted David, for whom this absence of effect was no failure, it confirmed his hunch. In jiggling the wire, Laura took the experiment into new ground. Oh, look what I did, I just crossed them. And the bulb lit. David said, try to find where it crosses to get to the right length. And David slid the crossing point of the wire systematically away from the bulb. They had found the point of crossover between the two sides of the long nichrome wire loop at which the bulb just went out. Getting that effect had entailed much straining between ideas and practices. They repeated this and varied it over and over. Laura saw that when the filament came on, it showed the tiniest little orange dot. Isn't it incredible? The teacher's relation to the strange wire evolved. Initially put aside, it became next to stand-in for normal wire, and then, at this point, it was an instrumental device, which Laura termed the dimmer. The long cord of the nichrome, the dimmer the light. How exciting. Like Faraday, they were inventing circuits to fuel their exploration of unknown wire and unknown paths of electricity, to become more aware of what it could do and what they didn't know. Since completing my Dibner postdoc, I have been teaching an exploratory seminar at MIT's Egerton Center, where Jed's teaching with experiments is remembered by director Jim Bales and Jed's student Chris Town. My students and I look to historical works and figures in science as companions and additional voices with us in becoming investigators together. Those in the past came to realizations of being in the unknown even in the midst of familiar settings. They groped and grappled with that experience as it evolved for them. We, too, are at a frontier in the classroom. A wonder emerges. There is matter to explore right at hand. None of us, not even the teacher, know in advance what will arise at that frontier. Curriculum emerges as participants respond to each other and materials of the world by ever resurgent doubt. Class explorations and projects have included following shadows, printing with movable type, watching the night sky by eye and historical means, making videos, uncovering physical effects related to historical discoveries, MIT history, the astrolabe, including making an astrolabe for each of our planets, paper marbling, and student presentations. Euclid was Jed's very first topic in the course I took with him on the 19th century. And in my class, we often start with reconstructing Euclid's geometry. One term, the class collaborated to apply Euclidean methods on a plaza outside to produce a very large square. The completed square didn't look square at all. Dismayed, the students checked whether its corner obeyed 3-4-5 ratio, but it did. The class exploded with curiosity to make a square that looked square, a project of extended duration, including bringing Euclid to life in their playful educational video, Play Ball, the house that Euclid built. Last fall, going outdoors in MIT's great court, a new adventure emerged for all of us, observing trees, collecting leaves, following changes. Fascinated since childhood with the trees in his native India, after our class one day, Akshay made the personal discovery that acorns come from oak trees. As Akshay, classmates, and I follow trees across the seasons, outdoors, 
and in classroom activities, we continually come across observations carrying surprises for us. I was unaware of how my view of trees harbors long-held yet unexamined assumptions now being upended. Our own novice curiosity for the sugar in tree sap accompanied by accounts of Native American sugaring intrigued us to the adventure of collecting maple saps ourselves. We've experimented with freezing, boiling, and tasting our sugary concoctions. In her final paper, one student, Jan, addressed Galileo saying, how is it ever possible to teach others scientific inquiry? It is a matter of lifetime work, as you did, always aiming toward a freer way of existing. We thank Jed for inviting us into that work.